right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Healthy Perspective Podcast. Today, we are going to have an amazing conversation with, with two like-minded people that, that are just out here to, to help people live a healthy lifestyle. Um, we have Dr. Alka with us. She's an award-winning international speaker and TEDx speaker. Her TEDx talk, Health is a Verb, Not a Noun, evokes the emotion behind the need to embed health as a skill. She's a lifestyle medicine doctor, longevity coach, and general practitioner. She's a founder of Lifestyle First, where health span meets lifespan, and also the creator of Lifestyle First Method, a 10-step blueprint for heightened health and lengthened longevity. Dr. Alka, thank you so much for joining me. Amazing. Thank you for that lovely intro. Hello. I'm, I'm excited to have this conversation, and I get excited every time I have another health professional on with me because it's like, yes, you, we get it. Like the, These are the type of conversations, these are the type of uh, practice that more and more people need to, need to turn to if we really want to change the world, you know, because like we talked about a little bit offline before, medicines and surgeries and whatnot are all good in emergency care. But it's really a, a, it's living with a short sighted vision. It's it's what's gonna be the future impact of a lifestyle dependent on on medicine for function. You know, if you have to have two or three medications and you can't forget them when you go on vacation, or um, you know, all, all those sort of things. It's like, what does that mean for the future? And in multiple different perspectives. One, obviously, how does it impact you if you, you know, are keeping needing more and more, or keep on needing to adjust them or dependent on someone, you know, knowing your, your specific milligrams of medication. But also you think about the, the environmental impact of, of making all these chemicals, you know, and, and a lot of them stem from fossil fuel um, making, you know, they're, they're, they're not necessarily something that we're harvesting from the earth that is sustainable. And so you look at the practice of medicine largely depend on diagnosis and medication in the long term and it really becomes kind of un unsustainable but then also for the practitioner right i mean i've talked with multiple different um doctors nurses pas and and especially the younger ones especially coming out of a, a covid you know um mess i guess we can describe that as they're getting burnt out in the first couple of years mm -hmm. of practice and if our doctors don't want to be doctors anymore I mean, what what happens, you know? And I think uh, your story is 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 similar. Um, so why don't you go ahead and get into that? Let's hear kind of your drive to become a doctor and and kind of your catalyst moments to kind of turning into this lifestyle coach who most medical doctors probably wouldn't brand themselves as um, today. Yeah, God, that's a really uh, brilliant intro to this really broad topic of uh, of health because it's where do you where do you start with it? And mm -hmm. I think for me, I mean, certainly my journey into medicine started um, like many other doctors, really. That I remember that interview to get into medical school and you get asked that question, "Why do you want to be a doctor?" And you know, it was no cliche when I said I want to help people. It was the absolute honest truth, and that and I thought my route into medicine was the way to to do that. Um, um, and off I went to medical school, ready to to get out into the world and fulfill that potential. Um, but I guess, Chris, it it takes a little bit of uh, realizing that the driver in medicine is exactly what you've described. The pharmaceutical industry is a huge giant and the way healthcare is set up and i think we have to have a distinction between healthcare and sick care we're putting all under the mm -hmm. umbrella of of healthcare of course but the way healthcare is set up is to provide the quickest fix in the shortest possible time for the greatest number of people mm -hmm. and when you've got one person in front of you that that doesn't work because mm -hmm. you forget what's important to that one person and the difference that you that you need to make so we take a big population approach in medicine, uh, which is why pharma pharmaceuticals come into it so quickly, because uh, they're the giants, they do all the research, they've got all the money, they they create the mindset of your, your very sort of typical doctor that comes out of, of medical school. And I think for me, I thought I was being a great doctor doing that for quite a number of years. And I do re remember uh, one particular catalyst, and I've had many, and I'm sure we'll come through them as we as we get chatting. But I do remember um, one particular day, a patient walking into my consulting room, and he was carrying a McDonald's milkshake in one hand. Mm. 
and he had a packet, a silver packet of, of pills, was a, you know, silver foil in the other hand. And he sat down and the McDonald's went on the desk and he pushed over this packet of pills towards me. And he said, my friend takes these, they're antidepressants. I think I need some too. Mm. And in, I had 10 minutes, you know, here in the UK where, I, where I'm based, it's uh, the general practice sort of consultation is set up for this 10 minutes of go, 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 go. And in 10 minutes, he walked out with his prescription for his antidepressants mm. and I was left after that with his McDonald's milkshake still left on my desk oh gosh and I looked at it and you know that was a real penny drop moment because I thought what I've just been practicing is exactly this it's McDonald's style medicine it's mm. in out in out buy one get one free what drug did you have last time oh this week's offer is you know have an extra one on top and I realized that whole sort of drug pusher sense of that was what was driving me as a doctor became really really apparent and that that mcdonald's mm. milkshake just kept staring at me for the rest of the day so i did make a, a big decision and it you know it takes a lot of courage to step out of what you know what you've been doing for a long time to think mm -hmm. this isn't it you know i went back to when i was 18 and that is not why i stepped in through the doors mm. of medical school and all the intensity and vigor of academic performance and learning that's that's needed there and so I stepped out and, you know, there were, there were other moments as well, but that was a, a very stark pivotal moment because it was so visual and so clear that this isn't the doctor that I wanted to be. So a uh, big dose of courage. And I left those comforts of partnership and practice um, mm -hmm. and kind of stepped into the unknown because yeah. how do you know what else to do? How do you know what is a better way to help people and to help people take care of themselves? I think that's mm -hmm. the key thing is, yeah. is, letting people recognize that health is in their own hands, which is the ethos behind my, my TEDx talk, which, uh, which you may have listened to, which is mm -hmm. very much about hold your yeah. hands, do not hand it over. Right. And, and that's the, it's the interesting paradigm shift we have to take people through. Uh, one thing I want to say is it's, at least we know McDonald's saved one life, right? Like <laughs> it changed <laughs> yours. I mean, not in the way that it would like to think, but, um, but it, it really, when, when you when you talk about like health health is is within you the at least in, in the united states i mean we i think i don't think you guys have direct to consumer marketing from big pharma like i can watch a nfl football game on sunday and and it's literally every other commercial is is yeah. something geared towards you there's something wrong with you go ask your doctor for this specific treatment or you know whatever and it's just subtle rewiring of you're not healthy inherently you need to tell somebody what healthy is to you when when you're kind of flipping the script where it's like your body knows how to be healthy we just have to really help you connect with what builds health right it's, it's we can get rid of disease sure but then another disease is going to pop up and you'll need a medication for the side effect that the other medication cause, like, you know what I mean? Like it's suppressing the symptom, not actually unearthing and revealing like, what is this? I don't know, an innate or what, what is this thing that we call life that started as two cells that's trillions of cells now that knew exactly where to put eyeballs and knew exactly where to put kneecaps and finger toe, fingernails. And, and what, like it knew all of that. And so we think we know more by giving it your, your, your levels should be this, that, or the other thing. When in reality, it's like, you're right. Every person is an individual. If I'm 250 pounds, five foot 10, my blood pressure is most likely going to need to be a little bit elevated because my body's stuck in a state of stress. So when we medicate it and bring it down, we're overriding the body's innate ability to know this is what I need to keep going, you know? So I, I love that just kind of like quick moment of like, man, I know that shake is causing this person's problems. And I know that shake is the tip of the iceberg. What else is going on that he couldn't bring into the office today? And so how did you start diving into like, man, what are the fundamentals of, of actually building health and, and kind of leading you? It looks like on, on your website and, and everything that you talk about, stress is the main factor that you're trying to get people aware of. So how did you start to come to terms with you know, you have chemical stress, you have emotional stress, you have physical stress that we're trying to um, make people aware of, right, and take action on. How did you start to identify these these different stressors and and um, help people take action on them? Because I think that's the other hardest thing. It's easy to go to the doctor and get a pill, 
Yeah. <clears throat> and I think that's a really important question because it's moving away from the elastoplast, sticky plaster over the wound type of medicine to getting right deep down into the core. And if you go back all the way to the top of the river and to the source of the river, what is mm. that underlying process that underlies everything? And and we know that stress is the biggest trigger and the pandemic we're not talking about at all at the moment, Chris, is the pandemic of stress. And that's mm -hmm. the one that we've been floating in for a long, long, long time because it's become relentless. It's all related back to our lifestyles, right? The way we style mm -hmm. our life, that is the root cause of stress. And when I talk about stress from a physiological aspect as well, that, that stress that triggers inflammation. So when your body is under constant inflammatory attack and, uh, and it's got its defense mechanisms on high alert all of the time, you're going to start running into problem because we're not designed for that constant go, 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 go. We're designed as human beings. As you said, innately, we have rhythms. We're designed to mm -hmm. oscillate and ebb and to flow. And we lose touch with those because of the 24 seven nature of the world that we live in. And that sense that we've got to be connected constantly to everybody, that overabundance of access to, to food that we have, that easy access to, we're not needing to move much anymore and we're getting comfortable with being comfortable. And so we mm -hmm. don't, you know, the way uh, that, we, that we used to. And so all of these things start to stack up. And um, the big problem that I find um, here, Chris, is that most people don't make that connection between stress and health. They might say very flippantly, oh, I feel stressed, but that connection between what's happening right now is affecting not just right now, but also your future and your longevity and your lifespan and your health span. Because what we know now, of course, is that stress causes inflammation and inflammation causes aging. So when you look again at the underlying processes, the genes that you're activating through stress, you're mm. speeding your way towards the end of your life way faster than you need mm. to. And it's all down to your lifestyle. We know this, that it's about 80% of disease and illness and everything else can be prevented and halted and stopped by zoning in on the important elements of your lifestyle. That's so good, you know, and, and I'm sure your studies into, or I guess out of Western medicine and into, you know, various Eastern medicines and, and really just things that are like, what's what's different than, than popping a pill? You know, you, you look at all these different cultures that have long lifespans and I feel like science and research wants to bring it down to, oh, they eat more omega-3s. Oh, they eat less um, red meat or they eat, you know, this and that and other thing. But what I'm seeing is the connector between all these people is like they eat dinner with their family. They work close to home. They practice these lifestyles of, of togetherness. And, and it's more of a, like you said, how they design their life is to be together and to do things together rather than I'm going to go carry the weight of the world on my shoulders and provide for everybody, being away from everybody, and then come home, expect everything to be done. And it's just, I don't know if that's kind of the, the hustle and bustle of the UK where you are. Uh, but I know here, and especially the, the town that I live in, it's a it's a commuter lifestyle. Like we can't pay for our lifestyles here. So we have to commute an hour or an hour and a half or, you know, and then we're eating fast food and then work is stressful. And so then we're, you know, uh, we don't have time with our families. And it's kind of this, like you said, one stress that we think is necessary then causes other stress in other parts of our life, with, which, that you know, it's just, like you said, this, we let our lifestyles be designed for us based on what work or what we think we need or a dollar or, you know, and, um, yeah, it's it, like I said, it's this paradigm shift that, that we need to mm -hmm. get across to people where it's like, listen, your, your health is not, not worth this, you know, extra $10,000 that you can make, or really let's start to have a different mindset. How can you create, this is my favorite thing on your website. How can we create a lifestyle that we enjoy? Yeah. And I think what happens, and I don't know if you noticed this, but when people are stuck in that state of sympathetic fight or flight dominance, mm -hmm. they lose the ability to create because the yeah. only thing they're thinking of is how to the three basic survival needs, shelter, water, and food. Like they, they have no emotional capacity. They have no dream capacity. They have no vision capacity. How do you speak that into people's lives to where they they get it and they're and they're ready to yeah. to start yeah. you know, stop that McDonald's habit and really enter into you know food prepping or you know whatever it is. Mm -hmm. 
So there's a couple of really good things that you've raised there. And it's reminded me um, that over this summer that's just passed, I spent a bit of time in Costa Rica. And mm. you'll know Costa Rica uh, over on the Nicoya Peninsula is mm. one of the blue zones where you'll find the longest living people. And uh, I went out to spend some time with a family there where there are five generations of family. Wow. And exactly as you described, these weren't families where the eldest kids are on their phones all day. They were out there in the farms, helping dad, physically agile, pulling fruit off the tree, milking the cows, connecting to their families, eating from the soil, eating together. And that made a huge difference. And the outdoors was a big part of their, of their life. Mm. And I met, um, I met a gentleman who was 103 years old. And just you know, holding his hand and this sense that this is possible, that mm. having a lifespan that extends into another century is absolutely within our grasp. Um, but the question remains, and I get asked this all the time, that it's, you know, all, it's all very well when you go to these blue zones and you've got the outdoors or you've got uh, uh, Okinawa in Japan, where again, everybody is outside another one of the blue zones. But what happens in our urban lives? You know, we have the mm. luxury of milking cows or being on fields. We've got busy, stressful urban lives. And my response to that is always that you can change your stress response in an instant. It mm. takes 60 seconds to go from that sympathetic activation that you said of that go, 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 and that flight or fright and that constant stress to the parasympathetic, the peaceful mm. nervous system, just by slowing down your breathing for 60 seconds, by thinking about gratitude at the mm. end of the day, by recognizing that you can just elongate the length of your life by standing up more, by knowing that the choice of food lies at the end of your fork is yours. You choose what you put in your mouth. That exercise doesn't mean you've got to go and pummel at the gym for 45 minutes. There's right. a different level of exercise, which is called movement. So do that. Um, and it's really bringing down that, what I call the complexity of life to the simplicity of living. And if we all did yeah. that, then we would really live our years healthier. And I think that's that's really key. And I think the second point that you raised was about the sort of mindset mindset work. And one I remember uh, very well from the times that I was sitting as a GP in my consulting room for 10 minute consultations is that I knew a lot about my patients. Remember, we build up a relationship over time. It, you know, it is yeah. a, it's an incredible role uh, to fulfill and an incredible privilege. So I knew where my patients were going on holiday, where their kids went to school, um, what they enjoyed doing. But the one thing that I didn't ever ask them, Chris, was what drives you? What's important yeah. to you? What gets Good. you out of bed every morning? So when I tell them that, you know, look, public health guidelines, they say you should exercise for 150 minutes a week. I'd expect them to just leave my room and go off and do that. And nobody would mm -hmm. do it. And they'd come back and I'd go, why? But it's because I, I didn't take time to understand mm. people's drivers, their mindset, mm. their motivation, that mm. emotional side. And I think that's so, so important is for any of us, we're only going to do the things that we think we should or we could or we want to if you've got a strong enough reason and exploring that is really important when it comes to lifestyle shifts when it comes to changes in your in your lifestyle you know we can all go on fad diets that are out there there's thousands of things people do lose that weight and we know it all comes right. back again yep. you, know, you can go on a great health trip and get that six pack but you know that this isn't going to be sustainable the sustainability mm -hmm. comes from creating habits and these are habits of the mind as well as habits of your physical body as well so i think that's the missing thing is is yeah. purpose and we know as well don't we that if you've got purpose in your day you live longer you add seven years to your yeah. life simply by having wow. an intentional life but having that purpose in your day wow. so there's a real missing trick going on there that we're, we're we're forgetting about social connection you mentioned as well again loneliness kills we know this so mm -hmm doing in communities or allowing people to to have that social connection which just goes beyond the the scroll on the phone right 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 and you know this guy is kind of going on a on a tangent but you mentioned um you know that these people that are living the longest are the ones that are more more self-sustainable you know they, they grow a lot of their own food they're able to go fishing in their backyard and have cows and you know this sort of thing and, and while that's it's not really um achievable for someone in a third story, you know, flat in, you know, in, in the UK or, or in LA or San Diego or, you know, whatever it is. 
what's super interesting, uh, and this is in, in America, farmers are two and a half times, have two and a half times greater chance of suicide. And 22 farmers are losing their farm, or 12 farmers are losing their farm a day mm. in 2022 because of rising feed costs and because of this, this, um, this same mindset in farming where it's more, 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 more corn, more production, yeah. more this and that, the other thing. And that's driven people to a point of where it's like, how do I do, you can't do any more, you know? And, and so getting back to that lifestyle of, of self-sustainability where it's like, this farm is dedicated to this 10, 20 miles around me. Like, you know what I mean? Like, this is where these people shop. This is where the, where we provide for it. You know, we run a super small farm um, on our property here and we could provide more than enough food for our block and, and neighborhood. And that's without everybody in their own backyard growing yeah. their own tomatoes or their own cucumbers or their own like, you know. And so I don't you, while you might be um, it might be better to do the whole gamut of exposure, of you know, the farm stuff. It's like, man, just that simple step of having intention of. No, wanting to know and grow your own food, even if it's your own tomatoes, taking care of something else that's not mm -hmm. your kids is huge. You know, like, did you see uh, that movie, uh, My Teacher Octopus? Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Like, right? Like, the purpose that just that little creature in the deep ocean gave that man, it's like, you can have the exact same type of thing with the with the plant i mean with with um an animal or you know like whatever it is like you said that that purpose oftentimes is not about what keeps you alive but it's about looking and providing value to other people you know you start to look at like i don't just want to put miracle grow on my on my tomatoes like i want to figure out what type of things they need to actually be nutrient dense and you start to dive deeper into and it's all it's none of it is about me like the end product the tomato takes two seconds to pick and put into your mouth but there's this uh, life cycle of the plant seeing it go from this big to this big and watching you know rats come and, and fighting those you know like it's this whole like dynamic of you are living in a, in a world for the betterment of something else you know i think what you what you mentioned with with purpose and that's completely different than this sympathetic dominant lifestyle of in it for your own good in it for your own success for sure for sure and there's something else i think important that you've raised again there may be people listening that say but look you know i'm living this urban life and and i don't grow tomatoes and i i don't have a field and this is not my lifestyle yeah but, um another little uh i guess a, a critical point for me was uh this summer as well i spent um some time in silence so we went off to mm. spain and i was in the mountains all alone and i didn't speak for seven days and what i learned to do was to be completely in awe of the world there are so many incredible beautiful things and you talking about that tomatoes just reminded me because you know this might sound completely off piste and crazy but i was able to fall in love with an orange holding it, not because I grew it, not because I'd watered the soil, but because somebody else had. There was another hand that had planted the seed. There was another hand that had watered the soil, another hand that had plucked the fruit, that had packed it, that had got it into my hand so I could smell it and savor it and have that vitamin C for me. And that sense of real gratitude when you think about, again, you know, food that arrives on your plate, how it gets there and thinking about that journey to you and connecting with that, even though, like you said, I, I don't grow tomatoes, I don't, right. <laughs> but I can still experience that sense of that journey and so that good. attitude. And we for, we forget to do that as well. And I think again, yeah. it's because life is so noisy. You know, being in silence mm -hmm. allowed me to just find that that space. Otherwise, your mind's like this those snowballs. You know, you shake them and everything yep. is just constantly going. But you just let that settle for a moment. And you learn about yourself. If you gain a mm. sense of identity, you understand more about your direction. You make more clear right. choices as well. So I think that's really, really important. That's so good. And, and I think, um, like you mentioned, like you don't necessarily have to grow it to, to be, appreciate it. You know, on the flip side, if you look at this uh, apple or, you know, tomato, you know, whatever it is, and you think about its lifestyle, it's like this was grown thousands of miles away shipped to me packaged marketed shined up it's like do i want to participate in this 
how can we find something different? Like, you know what I mean? Or it's like, I shook hands with the farmer that grew it. Or you know, like, so like even making those choices is huge. Recognizing too that like farmers are suffering right now. Like, especially ones that have been dependent on petrochemicals and whatnot. I mean, their costs are skyrocketing, but they can't charge much more for food. I mean, I know you're probably feeling it over in the UK as, as well. I mean, it's a, the everything in our life right now coming on the, on the tail end of COVID now into, you know, the, the economic COVID a pandemic or, you know, whatever, everything this world is trying to do is get you stuck in that state of fight or flight or stress. Cause if you're stuck, you obey, you don't think outside of what are the, what's the potential, you know, outside of any political conspiracy theories or, you know, anything like that. When, when you're stuck, you can get marketed and you're going to buy it just like we get marketed these drugs and medications in the United States. Like, Oh, maybe that's finally the answer to this thing that I've been struggling with rather than taking inventory of your lifestyle, like you mentioned, and just, just what can I change? Can I just be in more gratitude? Can I eat less McDonald's shakes? And, and can I walk up the stairs instead of taking the escalator or the elevator, you know, whatever it is to walk further, park further away from the, from the store or you know whatever it is and mm-hmm. I, I think I think you've done a really good job at putting in perspective like this lifestyle change doesn't mean you're now a CrossFit athlete that only eats this sort of food and that only you know that like these strict parameters that's still fight or flight that's still mm-hmm. stress that's still you're stressed out about doing certain things like what lifestyle brings life into you like mm-hmm. that's literally a part of the word life and most people's lifestyles is styling yeah. towards death rather than styling towards life yeah. um and i think a lot of people can can really benefit from the things that we talked about here and, and possibly the things that um you know you do it as part of your life as well mm-hmm. um i think a lot of people are stuck trying to figure out what's the thing how, who do i trust what do i you know what are my next steps um so i'd love it if you just kind of share if people want to in a sense embark on a journey with you or with your programs with your lifestyle where can they go? What is what is kind of jumping on board with just this this shift in lifestyle? Um, you know, th- for better health, for better longevity, for for a better life. What does that look like when working with you? So that's a, a really interesting uh, area to think about because I think what you're highlighting is that what I found as well is that most people don't know where to start because lifestyle mm. is like you say, it's the whole of your life. Like where do you actually yeah. start? Um, and this is what led me to devise um, a little bit of a, a very, uh, a scoring system. So a very helpful health and longevity scoring system. So putting into perspective my 25 years as a doctor, what I've learned mm-hmm. from probably over a quarter of a million patients that I've been looking mm. after is what are those key elements in your lifestyle that make the difference and we've talked about some of those today and we life's purpose and food and exercise and sleep so i've created those in a little acronym which is called your lifestyle which touches on all of those um, elements um and created a score which i call the lq so a little bit like your iq where you test mm-hmm. to see how clever you are cognitively mm-hmm. And your EQ, where you look at how smart you are emotionally, this Mm -hmm. is your LQ. So how smart are you about your lifestyle? What Mm. are you doing to prioritize it? And through that scoring system, and it's on my um, website, um, Chris, uh, DrArkPatel.com, you will be able to find the areas that are calling for your attention so that you know where to start. Is it? Let me start with sleep because that is where I'm scoring myself the lowest. I'm the one Mm -hmm. who's sacrificing sleep. I'm on my phone. I'm watching another episode of Netflix instead of actually Mm -hmm. looking at my quality of sleep. Is it creating habits because I just can't get that routine and rhythm? So I start things and I stop things and I can't sustain, sustain things. So the LQ will help you identify that big rock, where to start. And once you've done that, it's exactly as you said, there's always a ripple effect because we're so synergistically connected. Mm -hmm. You start to eat differently. You'll want to move differently. Once you're moving differently, you'll sleep differently. When you sleep differently, your emotions are changed. So your connectivity and your connections are changed. Your mental clarity changes. So just start with one area. Don't think you've got to think about everything. Allow some of that ripple effect to happen as well. But the other thing as well, um, which I guess brings us really kind of right up to date and into the 21st um, century, is that we're now living in a world where we've got a lot of access to technology and data and information about ourselves. So what we really should be doing is utilizing that 
getting really precise about the lifestyle changes that we're making, capturing your sleep data, for example, knowing whether you've had dream sleep or light sleep or, or deep sleep, capturing your sugar data, knowing whether your food is harming you or helping you, and then enjoy that process. I think health can become a very serious and terrifying and worrying thing to focus on, which is why people want to ignore it until they have to think mm -hmm. about it. But let's make health fun. Let's use data and numbers and information about ourselves to really zone in on being very precise and personalized about what we do. And back to what I was talking about earlier is not to have a population approach, but to have that individual approach, which is specific to you as well. I love that. And, you know, if you can't measure it, you can't change it. You know, if you don't know what's What's broken, that's why you get overwhelmed because you're trying to eat the whole elephant at once, you know, <laughs> instead of taking it piece by piece. And so I love how you break it down. And I love, you know, it's the getting those numbers, the the, the LQ, you know, it, it it might be traumatic, like to see that you got a three or, you know, whatever it is. And it's not meant to break you down and tell you how bad of a person you are. It's to reveal what the the consequences of that lifestyle that has in the future you can do whatever you want with it you know it, it's not designed to break you down as a person it's designed to, to help you so when you do these tests i'm going to go online and take it if it is a poor store don't be the victim mm -hmm. speak at a victory where i'm not going to be a three forever three is my starting point my goal is to be a five next and so i'm going in a month i'm going to take it again and see what I can do. And, and I think, you know, that's what's so hard for people, you know, and, and, you know, kind of in closing, I'm sure you've experienced this in medicine where you do a blood pressure test and you tell them, you know, they're 180 over 100 or something like that. And it's this super high blood pressure and they feel defeated. It's like, what's wrong with my body? Why isn't it this and that and the other thing? And, and sure, in an emergency situation, you want to bring that down, but then you can just start to talk about it. It's like, look, this, the only reason this is the way it is, either you're really nervous being here or, there's things in your lifestyle that are causing chronic stress. Because when are the times that your blood pressure is high? When you're stressed, when you're running, when you're exercising. Okay, so your your body's in a constant state of fight or flight exercise. What can you do now to take that away? And guess what? Your blood pressure will naturally go down as an intelligent response to I'm no longer living in stress. And so there's nothing wrong with your body. Our bodies are intelligent. Very. And expressing high blood pressure or expressing quote unquote, normal blood pressure. It's all about how can we now help it express intelligence for a long lifestyle yeah. rather than a 40, 50, 60 year old lifestyle, dependent on medicine to kind of function the way that you want to function. Um, so Dr. Alka, thank you so much for joining me. Um, are there any parting thoughts that you'd like to leave with people or have you left it all on the line already? I think we've talked about so much, haven't we? But absolutely, you know, echo what you've just said is use your numbers to give you a nudge. Use your data to drive your determination and not the other way around because your body and your mind are giving you signals constantly. Just got to tune in. Right. That's so good. Once again, thank you so much for joining me. I'm excited for people to um, start changing their lives. One lifestyle, you know, modification at a time. Absolutely. Amazing. Thank you, Chris.